This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Unfortunately, we likely all know someone in a marriage that's in a serious struggle. Well, getting to the point where a person says enough is enough can be difficult, especially in a marriage that is abusive or manipulative. In his new book, Enough is Enough, licensed psychologist Dr. David Clark shares the warning signs and steps to intercede when a marriage has become completely unhealthy. I want to emphasize that Dr. Clark will mention many times that he's not recommending divorce as the only option, but for many, it may be the only choice for the safety of a family. With me today is Dr. David Clark. I uh, just released a book, Enough is Enough, and Dr. Clark, thank you for being with us today. Well, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, when we talk about this, so often uh, people think abuse and they think physical. Uh, I, we hear about uh, emotionally abusing children, things like that. We don't think adults, two adults having a conversation or relationship as a husband and wife, that that's going to do that much damage. Uh, tell me the real definition of abuse. Here's my definition. I worked hard on this. I like it. It is a pattern, not just once in a while or he had a bad day or here and there, but it's a never ending pattern of narcissistic, disrespectful and harmful behavior exhibited by one person in an intimate relationship. Bottom line is it's one person slowly destroying another person. And they're doing that verbally or they're doing that with just their 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 body language or. A lot of different categories. We define this very carefully in the book, but it's almost always just verbal abuse, criticism like you wouldn't believe, and it never stops. Uh, your housekeeping, your appearance, uh, your handling of money, uh, it goes on and on. Uh, you know, how, how, you, how you handle your friendships, uh, what you said this morning, it's just constant barrage of criticism, keeping you down so the narcissist slash abuser can be up. It is control, control of money, control of your friends, control of where you go to church, control of how you handle the kids. In communication, often the narcissist or the abuser will not talk about topics he doesn't or she doesn't want to talk about. Well, you can't have a marriage that way. What so they you? will blow up and criticize you or they'll give you the silent treatment for weeks and sometimes months at a time. So what if, uh, if, if somebody suggested the spouse, the one that's being abused, that, well, if you just if you just continue to love them and just continue to meet their needs, that eventually that's, it's going to all work out for you. I mean, you used to say sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. And, and so just grow up. You're both adults. And if you love them and meet its needs, and in this case, I'm saying his, because I'm thinking of the husband as the abuser, but uh, that everything would work out. What, what happens in those cases? That's called enabling. See, that will work with a basic, decent husband who loves you and loves the Lord. Mm -hmm. It will literally never work, hasn't worked in the history of mankind ever since Adam and Eve with an abuser. It ends up enabling that person. So that's one of the most popular Christian approaches. Many pastors would recommend that. Well, if you just, it's a never ending. It, he doesn't care what you do. Uh, the ladies I talk to have 10 years, 15, 20, 25 years of doing everything they can. Makes no difference. He's an abuser and abuser is abuse. So that doesn't work. And he's not, and, and as, as long as you're meeting those needs, he's going to think everything's okay and right. life is good. I just, I got my way and uh, I don't really care about her needs. No, your pain, your agony, you know, tears. I have women that I cry myself to sleep every night. The guys right next door could care less. That is your problem. Everything is your fault. That's one of the hallmarks of narcissism and abuse. So yeah, he doesn't care. As long as his needs are being met, that's all that counts. So what we're talking about here isn't just necessarily an un un unhappy marriage where two people have just grown tired of one another or they're bored or whatever. It's just not an unhappy marriage. This is, this is damaging. This is something that sucks life out of people. It is. It is ongoing destruction of you and of your children if you have them. And then even the next generation grandkids are affected. Oh, yeah. I've worked with unhappy marriages my entire career, still do. I've got other books for that, other processes. That's where both are going to be involved, and the husband does this, or the wife does that. It's kind of a balanced approach. Can't do that with an abuser. Nope. Got to get away from him. And then we'll see what he does. Yeah, now, see, there's, a, there's their thing. You got to get away from him. You got to leave. Why? Why do they stay? I mean, people say, well, it's battered wife syndrome, but why would a woman stay and put up with that? She's an adult, too. Why can't, she, why can't she leave? Boy, I see this. I've seen it for 35 years. You know what? A lot of different reasons. Very often, this woman who's abused 
grew up in a home where she saw abuse, saw a dad treat mom that way. So it's, it's familiar to her. Uh, women are nurturers, they're carers. She doesn't want to get a divorce. She thinks it's better for the kids if she stays. And if she does uh, go to the church and the pastor, very often they will tell her, no, you do have to stay. You do have to submit. You do have to love him more. And so they, they have that going on. Plus they have all kinds of fears. Boy, what, what will leaving do? Can I survive financially? A lot of them were scared. Well, boy, if I get even just half custody, my kids are going to be with him half the time. I say, that's better than full time. It's you're being destroyed right now. But I have to convince them. I haven't had an abused wife yet. When I give her the pitch and sell her the book, she'll go, yeah, I'm ready. I'm going to leave. Uh-uh. Got to get through layers of resistance. Well, let's flip the plot here once because uh, the pastor may say it's your duty to stay and to submit. What if uh, the abuser is the wife and the pastor's telling the husband that, hey, you're the, you're the head high priest of your home. Take spiritual control here and get her in line. What, what do you say to that? Oh, yeah. It's, a, it's just the same thing in reverse. And I see that happening, too. And there are more and more really female narcissists and female borderline personality disorder and abusers in their own right. It seems like whoever's in the office, the one that really is the abusive one, gets a pass, man or woman. And the other spouse, pastors tend to think, well, you know what, whether it's the biblical thing and the, the man's the head, or if the wife has to love him more and submit, they tend to go with that person because this person is the one that looks like is willing to change. And so the, the burden's put on them, which is just the opposite of what you should do. When I have an abuser in my office, I will say, you're, you're, you're abusive. Let me explain why. Uh, they don't like it and they leave my office very quickly, slam my door. Too bad. I'm not going to work with them anyway. I'm going to work with the other spouse. You're going to work with the one that needs survival in this case. Right. Uh, and the big thing with Christians is that uh, we feel that uh, this is something we've got to be able to put in God's hands, pray about it. And if, I, if, I, if it doesn't work, I'm unsuccessful. I'm a less of a Christian. My Bible study partners are going to think I'm less of a Christian. My pastor's going to think I'm less of a Christian. I've got to just stay here and trust God to fix this thing. Uh, and, the, and in a lot of cases, uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, chapters in your book is that my church threw me under the bus. I just felt like I couldn't even go to the church. Yeah, it's tough. So many ladies are already having the trauma of abuse. And nobody knows what's happening because you don't broadcast it. It's embarrassing and you're trying mm -hmm. to get, get the guy to change. But yeah, once you leave, and I got to get ladies ready for this. Have a church to go to. Have a support team. It's going to be a small one. He's going to win the PR battle almost across the board. What's the matter with Mary? How could she leave, you know, Glenn? Glenn's the greatest guy in the world. He's on the church finance committee. They don't have a clue. So you have to get ready for that. A lot of rejection coming up. It's still worth it. You still have to get out. Well, and then there's always been the, the, the stigma of uh, if you separate, the next step is divorce. And, and if the person is being, uh, uh, having some affair or something or being unfaithful, then you have no grounds for divorce. And so why separate? Because separation is just the first step to a divorce. So, yeah, people think that, and I, not necessarily. We're, we, in my plan, we give the abuser, man or woman, a bona fide golden opportunity to repent and change. Now, if he or she does it, okay. I still don't recommend divorce. You're safe. You're separate. You're providing for your own needs. Uh, you've got the custody thing worked out. So then at that point, God has to guide you, and it could very well lead to divorce. So from what Because most of these abusers won't file. Yeah. They'll make you file. So, yes, because they, in that case, it's your fault. And uh, exactly. that, yeah. right, that fits the narrative. I yeah. can, she filed on me. Yeah, right. And God has no problem with that because chronic, never ending emotional abuse is, in fact, a biblical reason for divorce. Uh, yeah, and in, in the case of, of the separation, and you're saying that that may be the first step in saving the marriage, that if they stay, it just prol proliferates, it just continues to grow. The guy or the abuser thinks they're winning and that everything's okay and this is my life and I'll run it. But the separation is this cold shower, this cold slap in the face that, hey, something's got to change. Right. 35 years I've never seen an abusive marriage change, the abuser change when you stay with him. Never once. I've seen a number of times. Now, the numbers are good. Four to six percent will change, but that's at least something. It only happens when you leave. You lose your woman. That will determine if you're going to break and repent and come to the Lord and walk with Jesus and be the next Billy Graham and, and do all your work and win your woman back, which you should do, or you'll get more of the same. Well, it's just confirming you made the right choice. 
Well, you know, we're, we are told that we're, in, in this life we're going to have suffering, and in this life, uh, uh, in the name of Christ, we're going to suffer. So I'm a Christian spouse, and I'm a believer, and so this is, this is my cross to bear. I've got to, I've got to bear this suffering. Yeah, no, not, many people believe that. It, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't apply. This is not suffering for Jesus. This is just suffering. And, and the key is the suffering doesn't lead to any good outcome. You're destroyed. Your children are destroyed. Your little boys are going to grow up to be abusers. Your girls are going to grow up to date and marry abusers. No. There's a lot of scripture, and of course I have it in the book, that, that clearly teaches in this kind of an extraordinary case of ongoing abuse, emotional abuse, let alone physical. Okay, we're talking about emotional. Yeah, yeah. You get away from that. You confront the sinner. When he doesn't respond, you get away from it. So what, in, what is that, in Romans? Yeah, we've got, we got, well, Matthew 18, 17. Mm-hmm. The basic principle is when you have a serious sinner, okay, you confront that sin lovingly, firmly, when it, it doesn't respond after a number of times. And these ladies have done this for 30 years, 25, 15 years. When there's no response, okay, and the church is involved, then you, then you pull away. Yeah. You ostracize that person. That's the separation piece. We see it in Matthew 18. We see it in Romans 16, 1 Corinthians 5, the serious sexual sin. You, you, he's disfellowshipped, and you get away from that person. So that's that's truly a biblical biblical approach then it absolutely is it's crazy that most pastors have read those verses they don't think it applies to this scenario it absolutely does there's no caveats why is to be your husband or wife okay why why is it that that pastors don't see and i don't want to generalize all pastors because some that that, that do get this but why is it uh are we not teaching this in, in in uh pastoral counseling that that this is just as bad a case of abuse as physical abuse or as, as a uh, unfaithful spouse. Why, when you tell the you tell the spouse to find a, a good solid Christian therapist or a good solid Christian pastor who wants to take a biblical approach, they automatically think their pastor is taking a biblical approach because they've been sitting under his teaching for the last fifteen years. Uh, right, and they, and they, they tend trust to that. It. They trust that pastor. Yeah, see that you, you hit the nail on the head, Bob. They they're not getting the training in seminary or Bible school, Bible college. They're not. What they get is a some, and even this is rudimentary, but some training on the basic marriage that has problems, where you balance things. This is not the case; it's a special case of abuse, and they have no experience with. It. Yeah. All right. And then there's this, and there's this this sense in which pastors they're usually nice people, uh, often you know more passive. They don't want to deal directly with the abuser when he's in the office. And so it's just easier to deny the abuse or have the wife do the work. It's just completely out of their league. And they end up in their own way without meaning to. They keep further abuse on the spouse that's being abused because they mishandle it. We'll have more from Dr. Clark in just a moment. Would you like to help expand the reach of Viewpoint with Bob Placey? Then sign in with your YouTube account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now would do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places that missionaries can't even reach. Thank you for helping us reach the world by sharing Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Our culture is moving away from a biblically-based lifestyle faster than ever in history. Even many believers struggle to explain their own viewpoint on who Jesus really is. God says in the Old Testament that my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. That's why TV44 created Viewpoint with Bob Lacey, a program that discusses biblical issues and how they relate to our culture today. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, so no topics are off limits. But we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners. Maybe you've never supported a Christian media ministry before, but in today's world, our message is needed more than ever, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. What is a biblical approach to ending a marriage in which a spouse is mentally or physically abusing the other? 
Dr. David Clark, a psychologist specializing in marital crisis, in his book, lays out the steps for the abused spouse to separate themselves from an unsafe marriage. What's the strategy that, that if she's going to leave, she's going to be successful? How does she succeed at this? Well, I've, I've got a number of steps in the book. No, no, this is, this is going to take time to prepare. The lady's not ready to leave. Even, first, I convince her you're being abused and it's best for you to leave. And here's what the Bible says about leaving. God wants you to leave. He's not just okay with it. He wants you to. Yeah. Okay, once I get that buy-in, only the first step. All the lies have to be got through the resistance. And how can I pull this off? I'll tell you exactly how to do it. It's step by step by step. Might take you six months. Might take you a year. Might take you a year and a half. You've got the support team to develop. You have to get emotionally strong and shred your codependency and build your self-esteem up, which he shredded. You got to get the kids ready. You got to get an attorney. You got to be able to make money. I don't care if you're 80 years old. I will accept no excuse for staying with an abuser. Now you can. God love you. You can do that. You're still going to heaven. God's not going to reject you, but he doesn't want that for you. Here's somebody that's been abused emotionally, spiritually for years, and now they're going to get spiritually or emotionally healthy. What's that look like? You know, it, it is a secret plan as much as possible, yet we don't want the guy to know. So they will never read this enough as enough book, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're doing things in a, in a sneaky way, but it's, it's the best way because he will, he'll move heaven and earth to destroy you if he knows you're leaving him. So he's not to know. Even the counseling piece um, is going to be, he might know you're seeing a counselor. If you can work it where he doesn't know, fine. But if he needs to know, you simply say, look, honey, I've got all kinds of personal problems and I'm working on me so I can be a better wife. He'll buy that because he thinks you're nuts anyway. He thinks you're the problem. So that will even be okay. But the attorney, you, you start getting, you have a separate account. You're starting to gather a war chest. You're telling key family and friends and they're not to confront him yet. That's down the road. So it's just step by step. You need a good, tough attorney, not a passive Christian attorney who's a wimp because they lose. You want somebody tough. I mean, as tough as I tend to be in my office, who will be your advocate. And then they'll know all about the finances. Most states, it's half and half. So legally, part of my plan is with, with, the, with the attorney's uh, help, you will take half the money. Once you get access, you get, you'll take the half the money before you leave. No apology. You can do that legally. And those other steps. You could talk about getting a job, and, and if he thwarts you on that, you, there's ways to get around that. This is still America. You'll get some heat from that, but you want to have, I want to contribute to the household. I've had ladies tell their abusers, Bob, you know, Tim, what if you drop dead? I, I, want, I have to be able to have some income. So there's things you can do, training. You just got to press forward because you're at, he doesn't know this, but you're planning on leaving him, and you have to have an income. Yeah, how, how did uh to get spiritually ready when all this flies in the face of what they may have been taught in church in the past, to get spiritually ready to understand, to get out of denial and understand that God really wants them to take this step. Uh, what do they need to get spiritually ready? I tell them, first of all, read 1 Samuel 25, <laughs> the story of Abigail and Nabal. This is God's living example of a woman who was living with a narcissistic abuser, awful, vicious man, petty, a miser, he thwarted David, selfish pig. I mean, just a dirt ball. And, and Abigail, in, in those picture. days, had, had no rights. No rights of any kind. He could have run her neck and killed her in front of the entire community, and no one would have said a word, because women were property. But through a series of steps, miraculously, she gathered, she, she followed my plan. Actually, I'm following her plan. <laughs> secret, secret approach, Nabal didn't know. She gathers the household, she gets the, the provisions to, to David, and of course, God took Nabal out. But that is an example of God speaking very clearly. Get out. I'm going to help you. Now, it worked pretty quickly for her, but uh, normally it takes longer than that. But that's an example of, hey, you can get out. I have to convince them it's right and that you can do it. And frankly, you should do it. So this, this uh, uh, building this team of warriors that you talked about, where they've got to get a team around them. It's not just something they're going to do on their own. They're not out there by themselves. Uh, if they're a timid person to begin with, What's your best advice to, uh, uh, to that first step? Do they find themselves a spiritual mentor? Do they go get a job? What's their first step if they're kind of timid about building this group of people around them? Maybe they've been kept away from, if this guy's been controlling their life, they've been kept away socially, maybe from friends. How do they build this team? What's the, what's the first step in doing that, and especially finding a spiritual advisor? Well, the pre-step usually is getting them stronger. Because, yes, just as you say, Bob, I can't do this. A lot of I can'ts. I can't, I can't, I can't. No, that's not true. 
So is that your is that your part? Is that your part as the as the counselor to to get them out of that denial? Right. Oh yeah, with? yeah. And I'm as you can tell, I'm a pretty direct person. I'm yeah. I'm, I'm going to cut through it. I'm going to hammer them. I'll spend some time. You got to be patient because they're just full of lies and excuses, and you can understand it because they're weak, they're controlled, and the guy has shredded their confidence and and their identity. Who am I? I don't know. So we got to build that up first. Then they can make a tentative step and choose the right accountability person. We said they've got a they've got a spiritual mentor, right? Uh, somebody can confide in. Somebody's an accountability partner that holds them accountable to hanging in there. Who else is on that team? And you talk about a, a bulldog lawyer. You got to get a tough bulldog yeah. lawyer. They, they, they're expensive. Yeah, and, but, and the, who, but the 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 lousy ones lose. We want somebody tough because you're going to war. This guy's going to try to destroy you in the in the divorce process. So you got to have a tough one. So who else doesn't have to be a Christian? Doesn't have to be. Who else is on this team? Selected family and friends. If you've got a supportive dad and mom and maybe a, a, a brother or a sister, by all means, sign them up. They should be on your side. Some crazy families aren't. Okay, forget them. If you have an abusive family, they won't, they'll blame you. Don't do that. But key family and friends, small group. If you can get a tough Christian therapist who is your advocate, they can help you grow emotionally and spiritually too. That person's also on the team. Okay, well, we talked about uh, Matthew 18 and, and being biblically accurate here. And, and you also mentioned in your book that from your experience, maybe 4 to 6% of these abusers will actually make the transition to a godly husband. Yeah, uh, very, very low numbers. It's it, 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 a do, bona fide abuser, yeah. And, and you're talking about when you want to complete this. this you're not recommending divorce here. You're rep- recommending separation to save a marriage. Right. Separation is as far as I go. So what, God, God will have to guide you down the divorce route. What, what happens here if, if, you, if you go to that abuser and say, here's how you're going to win me back? That's, that's, the, that's the Cinderella part of the story is that, they can win, that, that this, this person can win their abused spouse back. How do they do yeah. that? That's, that's a long road. Oh it, oh, it is. If once you're out and you're safe and you've got the kids and you've got some legal things in place to protect you financially, you, 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 you help him cool his heels for a month, very low content, other than him seeing the kids, which you have to. Uh, then through other people, not even directly, through intermediaries, support team members, you're going to give him. If, if at that point, now if he's, if he's blasting you and lying all over town and is vicious and can't believe you left him, you don't even bother. But if he's showing signs of, gosh, I, I want to win you back, you don't believe it because he might be lying. Mm-hmm. But you give him a list of things to do that will curl his hair. They're all tough. They're all reasonable. And then we see what it's going to take him seven, eight months at the minimum to work on himself in individual therapy, celebrate recovery, spiritual accountability, uh, telling the truth about all the things he's done to you, to you and to the kids and to everybody else. It's hard. Most of them aren't going to do that. But some of them will step up and, and, and start, right? Some will. I've had some wonderful cases, that, total brokenness. Like Saul on the way to, you know, Damascus. I mean, boom, I, I found Jesus. I, I, I work with a couple of guys right now in, in phone advice who have been nasty that by their own admissions, adulterers, and emotional abusers, and now they're in a process of winning their wife back. They're, they're following the program. Yeah. Hey, I never know who's going to be the 4 to 6%. It surprises you sometimes. But there, there, is, there is hope for these, for these people that have been abused. One, to either to get out from underneath the abuse, and two... The ultimate hope would be to, to save that marriage and, and make it a godly marriage. Right. And that can happen. No, that's, but this is the only way I've ever seen it work. And I know, I'll tell these ladies, look, he may not ever change. I- I'm telling you that. Let's give him a chance. But getting out is better for you and better for your children. There's no question about that. This is what God wants. That's a separate issue of if he's going to change or not. It's on the burden is now on him. He's always put the burden on you to be different and you're, you're not good enough. If you were a better wife, no. A lot of people don't realize because of maybe it's because the, the you know the, the teaching they've received over the years don't realize they're really being abused. They may think this is they've been told it's normal. They've been told you're the wife submit, and this person has been abusing them for years. Uh, for years, can you give them maybe three identifiers that, that would tell them that yeah you're a victim right now and you need to get out? What would be those maybe those three key points that they need to know? First thing is, okay, this is and often about 98% of the time, the abuser is a narcissist. So these, these will apply to that too. Number one, everything that happens is always your fault. Always your fault. This person never admits fault or apologizes. If they do, it's bogus because they never change. It's all on you. 
It's that also that constant barrage of criticism. And the key, one of the keys is they don't meet your needs. They have no idea you have needs. You're a pilot fish. You only exist to serve them. And when I talk to these ladies, I can tell within 20 minutes, if not sooner, as they're just telling the story, they think it's normal. As, as you say, Bob, this is how I'm living. How can you help my marriage? I say, I can't help your marriage. I can help you. That's going to come first. And maybe we can go from there. They don't want to hear that. I say, you're being emotionally abused. That's why we spend the first six chapters of the book, as you know, very careful to finish. This is what you're living with. This is what it looks like. And oh, I, I, am I, they don't want to admit because if they admit I'm being emotionally abused, then they have to do something about it. And they've been told just the opposite by the pastor, by the people in their own head. This is just the way, this is what the marriage is like. No, it's not. This guy is a, is a skunk. He is destroying you. This is a monster. And, and you can get away from it. Well, looking through the book and reading through it and uh, talking with other people about it, it is, it is on the edge. It's kind of, kind of, it's, it's harsh. It's a, it's, a, it's a harsh thing to look at when you're going to say, you got to be separated, you got to do this, you got to do these things. And it's not a, it's not a popular, it's not going to be a popular book in a lot of, a lot of uh, libraries and a lot of pastors' libraries. <laughs> Boy, isn't that the trip? Uh, <laughs> I've always wanted, of course, bookstores are gone now, but I always wanted a pyramid of my books at the beginning of the bookstore. I've never had that. This will certainly not. <laughs> this wouldn't make No, it's tough. Yeah, but it's, it's published by Moody and it's uh, enough is enough. And, and if somebody's out there right now and, they're, and they're, they're living through this and this is ringing true with them, uh, I'm going to suggest they get your book and, and uh, find themselves a, a, a really strong spiritual counselor. Boy, I hope so. I hope we're, we're seeing, we're seeing uh, many lives changed. I do a lot of phone advice, of course, in, in therapy sessions, email with people. It's having an impact. And, and yeah, it was, it's a God thing, a miracle that Moody published it because they're very careful and, and as they should be. And we went through a lot of editing. It's as good as it can be. It's mm -hmm. carefully done. It's solidly biblical. It's edgy. I'm an edgy guy, as you can tell. I, I'm, I'm a direct talker. Eh, that's who I am. But this is what's required in this area. Yeah. I'm not going to hold somebody's hand. I'm going to give them the truth and hopefully get them out of an awful situation. Well, as you mentioned, it's not, it's not just them. It's children. It could be grandchildren. And you had a grandmother in your office. So it's, it is, it's life-saving, marriage-saving, and, and it's biblically correct from what I can see. So, Dr. Clark, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, uh, just praying the book does well and gets in the hands where God wants it, to, wants, wants it to go. I hope so. Thanks so much for this interview. I really enjoyed it. Dr. Clark's books, including Enough is Enough, are available on several Christian bookstore websites and is published by Moody Press. Thank you for watching today. You know, Viewpoint is made possible by the support of our viewers, as our content's not something that can be sold to advertisers. If you benefit from this show, I'd encourage you to support us regularly with a financial gift. Thanks for supporting and watching Viewpoint. For more interviews on demand, plus additional resources from today's guests, go to WTLW.com and click on the Viewpoint tab. If you are enjoying Viewpoint, we would appreciate your financial gifts so we can continue to produce more programs.